So I've made a Pia uh, Bandman Katanza, the um, co host. So you should be able to run the meeting. Yes. Hello. Can people hear me? Yes. Great. Okay. Very good. I can also hear people. Pavel, could you say something? You will start. Hello. Hi, Katanza. Hello. Yes. I can hear you well. We can Perfect. see your slides. Okay. Uh, we still have around two minutes. Okay. So I think start on time but i tell you right away that i would be very strict with times okay <laughs> to, okay and we have to take care of this so i will remind every speaker two minutes before he's supposed to finish the talk so we have uh, talks now in the beginning 18 minutes plus two minutes discussion and some talks are uh 18 minutes total so this will be um 15 minutes but three minutes discussions okay and Sounds I will good. remind you um, two minutes before you are supposed to finish your talk. Okay. 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 Sounds good. We still have a minute. <laughs> so you can start, uh, the audience can start looking at my slides because I will skip 10 slides. Oh, <laughs> in, in, in the, uh, oh that is yes. a nice trick, Pavel. <laughs> I see we have almost 40 people connected. Let's give the last people a chance. Ah, it's 25, I guess. So good afternoon and good morning, everybody. It's my absolute pleasure to chair the first session of the working group one, which is um, structure functions and power on densities. And we will start this afternoon or this morning with the review from the PDF groups and experimental results uh, from HERA. And our first speaker today um, is uh, Pavel. He will tell us about CTEC T part on distribution with the LHC data. So Pavel, please speak, uh, start now, and I will remind you two minutes before you are supposed to finish your talk. Okay. Okay, perfect, Katarzyna. Well, thank you very much. Um, I will present you one, the first of eight talks uh, from the CTEC T group working on the part and distribution functions. And let me start by uh, briefly telling you what the other seven talks are. Um, so uh, uh, the, the last year was very productive for our group and we started many issues uh, and uh, they will be, well, some of them will be reported at, the, at this workshop. Uh, there will be three talks dedicated to large X deep and elastic scattering and PDFs on the lattice. Uh, as you know, the LAGEX um, uh, PDFs have become a very important um, issue in QCD with the advent of the Electron 9 Collider and high precision LHC data. And so we will have uh, some new results to show you in these three talks. Uh, then there will be two talks dedicated to the feed of the combined hero charm data and to a new uh, heavy quark flavor scheme for hadron hadron scattering. Uh, Keping Se will also present new PDFs uh, with the QED effects. Uh, and that what I will do today, I, I will focus on um, uh, the, some issues that, that are not covered on the seven talks. Uh, in, in particular, I will uh, remind you about the major study uh, called CT18 that we completed uh, in 2019. But uh, in fact, the last year we spent a most of, a significant amount of time to refine the study. And so, for example, uh, the review of the paper, which uh, is 90, 94 papers, uh, 94 pages long, um, took us uh, many months. And so the paper was, it was extended as a result. We also um, studied multiple of implications of CT18 PDFs for the LHC uh, physics and um, uh, other experiments. Now, in addition to this uh, major paper uh, dedicated to the PDFs, uh, we also uh, completed and published a review in, uh, for, uh, of the theory and statistical methods that go in, uh, into the PDF analysis. And so this is the paper shown at the bottom of the slide. Um, essentially, some of the methodological choices that we make are based on the discussion in this paper. And so therefore, if you wish to understand why we made certain choices in the CT18 analysis, you might as well look at the second review paper uh, written together with Dave Sopor and Karel Kavarik. Uh, now, uh, the CT18 PDFs were, were in fact released in 2019. Now, the, the reason they are called uh, 18 and not 19 is because we uh, included the LHC data, which was available roughly by the middle of 2018. Uh, we had to select the data that on one hand is informative about the PDFs. Uh, on the other hand, it must be 
precise in, in it also must must be consistent with uh, other experiments and so therefore uh, after applying several uh, selection uh, uh, techniques we um, uh, uh, we uh, perform the fit that includes um, 11 additional uh, in LHC experiments, and of course the combined here one plus two DS data, and so these experiments are both consistent with one another, and they are also precise enough. There is one experiment, the Atlas Seven TV WNZ production, that is extremely um, precise. On the other hand, as many of you know, it is not uh, in perfect agreement with the uh, some of the other data sets, especially from deep and elastic scattering, and so therefore we did not include the. Atlas 7 TV um, uh, WZ data in the default feed called CT18, but we provided some alternative feeds which do include this data set. And so therefore what you will see is that the treatment of this uh, 7 TV data set is uh, somewhat different compared to the other data sets that, are, that go into our analysis. So this is a, 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 a slide showing um, various uh, studies that we have done to understand this data and also to obtain high quality feeds. I don't have time to go through through detail, just would, would like to flesh some uh, aspects. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, our default set that we recommend for the majority of uh, applications is called CT18. And so this is the set which is quite similar to CT14 and NLO, and it actually makes many similar choices that were done in CT14 and NLO. But then uh, if you wish to study the full range of the uh, pos uh, possible predictions based on the PDFs, you could use other sets. And so the most uh, different set that we provide is called CT18Z. Now I I'll explain uh, to you uh, what CT18Z is in a minute. And the, the, there are two additional sets called CT18A and X that lie between CT18 and CT18Z. However, if you really wish to quickly understand the uh, variation in the uh, PDF predictions for, for example, for pattern luminosities, you could just take CT18 and uh, compare with the predictions for CT18 and 18Z. Uh, in this case, you will find that uh, the predictions don't quite overlap, especially at low invariant masses. For example, if you wish to study what is the uncertainty uh, in N3 low predictions due to the unknown uh, contributions to next to next to leaning other PDFs that, that are uh, the only PDFs that are available right now. You could take CT18 and CT18Z prediction, which has somewhat different assumptions of theory going into the analysis. And then the spread between the CT18 and CT18Z will give you some feeling about the importance of high order effects. Now, uh, here is a table summarizing what the difference between CT, these four sets is. So CT18 set is the default one. Now, as I mentioned to you, uh, there is the special Atlas 7 ZW data set is included in CT18A. Um, we provided a special PDF set called CT18X. And so this is a set that is obtained with a special scale with, which mimics saturation effects in the small X region at HERA. And so, so now uh, the effect of the small X saturation scale goes roughly in the same direction as the effect of the including Atlas 7 ZW data. Therefore, to obtain the maximally different PDF, we include both the Atlas 7 ZW data and we also choose the special factorization scale uh, in deep inelastic scattering. And that's what produces the CT18Z. Now, uh, here, here is a figure that shows the magnitude of the um, a PDF uncertainties that come out from these feeds. What I wish to point out is that this is not just experimental or uh, parameterization uncertainty. In fact, our um, estimate for uh, the CT18, let's say CT18 uncertainty includes uh, can be contributions uh, from four sources, the experimental, theoretical, parameterization and methodological uncertainties. So a part of the time, a part of the reason we spend so much time on studying these PDFs is because we try to uh, carefully estimate the impact of these uncertainties. Now, for example, the uh, error band of the CT18 PDFs is wide enough to uh, cover central predictions from the feeds that are obtained with different choices of the parameterization. And so we, uh, we tried about 250 candidate non perturbative for parameterization forms in addition to the published CT18 uh, parameter parameterization form. Now, uh, the other uh, concern that we have is that these uncertainties must be moderately conserv conservative, meaning that, for example, uh, the CT18 set must not 
at least nominally exclude the CT in 18Z sets. So the uncertainty bands should overlap. And so that's a consideration which is important because again, we do not want to uh, create the message that one of our, these error sets is clearly uh, disfavored compared to the other sets. So therefore really uh, the, actually the overlap of the uncertainties band uh, will uh, we'll describe what the actual uncertainty on the predictions is. Okay, and so um, now this is important because again, uh, there are choices that we can make, let's say ECT in ec ec 18Z, which will produce quite different PDFs. Um, even uh, in, the moder in the region of moderate large X values where we have many experimental constraints. For example, suppose we use the special factorization scale in deep inelastic scattering. And as I mentioned, well, this, this scale is, is motivated by uh, well-known saturation physics that tells us that PDFs uh, at small x evolve slower than predicted at the fixed order in perturbation QCD. Uh, now, uh, the, the effect of this small x um, in, uh, 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 modification can be included either by applying the, the exact the, uh, direct small x resummation. So, so for example, you could ca calculate uh, the coefficient functions using the uh, resound predictions, uh, which include in the next to leading log tower of small x BFK logs. And uh, as you know, uh, if, you, if you perform this resummation, you obtain PDFs that are somewhat different compared to the nominal PDFs coming from the standard fixed order analysis. So that this is, has been done by NNPDF and XFITA group. Now, uh, what we found in our feed is that in fact, you can obtain very much the same variations in the PDFs. If you use uh, a different factorization scale, but still with the fixed order cross section. And so the fixed order, the, this factorization scale has some X dependence. In fact, this X dependence is sort of similar to what is predicted by the saturation scale. So then you could imagine that there is some kind of real saturation physics happening and uh, B, the ABF scale approximation is um, uh, working at relatively small X. So it, 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 apply, it, it, it um, basically predicts the effect of the saturation at the perturbative level. However, in principle, there are also high order uh, uh, saturation effects. And so the full saturation equations can be quite different from the BFK equations. So therefore, uh, using the special PDS with the X dependent scale, you actually can uh, test various scenarios for the small X dependence. For example, well, um, this is the study that um, it has been uh, initiated uh, last uh, year by Keping C. Uh, you could look at the differences of, on, the, on the PDFs coming from these two approaches. The PDFs come out to be quite different. However, it's more instructive to, to, to look at the differences in the predictions for the structure functions themselves. And so for example, you could, uh, okay, uh, calculate the structure function using the fixed order coefficient function and the PDF with the small scale or you could calculate the, uh, the, the same structure function with the BFK resummation and the resum resumed uh, PDF. And so what happens, uh, you can look at this slide in more detail. In fact, these two approaches give very similar prediction for the absorbable structure functions. So especially the structure function F2 that comes out from these two methods is very much the same. So that there is no major difference. You see more differences in the structure function FL as you expect. And so therefore, by looking at the structure function FL, you can, in fact, you can test uh, the differences between these approaches. These differences happen only at X values that are currently outside of the uh, accessible range at HERA. But uh, let's see, if we go to the large hadron electron collider, you may be able to do the measurements at much smaller X values, which may distinguish between these, these different scenarios. Now, uh, <clears throat> very briefly, I would like to show, flash two slides showing how uh, the, the CT18 predictions compared to uh, the various uh, double the, uh, LHC cross sections. So the answer is that they describe the, uh, well, at least the total cross sections reasonably well. Um, there was another major interesting development uh, uh, about uh, two months ago. Uh, the Sequest experiment published the ratio of uh, the deuteron to proton cross sections in the production of the Julian pairs. And what they found is that this measurement disagrees with the E866 experiment suggesting a suppressed ratio of D bar over U bar at roughly at X of 1.3. Now, uh, in all these figures you, uh, that, that are provided by Sequest, you also see the CT18 curves. And so sometimes um, the discussion of this 
uh, uh, figure some, well, doesn't mention the CT18 curves. In fact, there is a lot of interesting physics happening with the CT18 curves that you see. Now, first of all, the CT18 PDFs agree very well with the E906 data at all accessed values, but also compared to the other predictions that are shown on this uh, plot, uh, the CT18 analysis performed a much more comprehensive uncertainty estimate. And so therefore we obtained a much wider uncertainty bands but they are more reliable. They, they, they take into account many other effects that are not uh, included uh, in, in other predictions. You can actually learn some interesting information from this. For example, normally people focus on the range of large X where, well, clearly the sequest is above E866. However, if you do the uh, full statistical analysis like in CT18, you find that the main problem of E866 is with um, the other data in the global analysis at X of about 0.1. So it's, it's to the left from the sequest uh, me measured range. And so here is a, a figure sh showing what happens. Basically, uh, if you look at the D bar over U bar ratio, you find that if you include full, uh, for the full uncertainty into account, in fact, this ratio can be above one or below one in most of the X range, except at uh, X of about 0.1 where it is pulled upward by E866 experiment. So the E866 does prefer the, the larger D bar over U bar ratio, but this pool is opposed by uh, several DAS experiment. And this is, you see in the plot, which is shown on the right called, based on the so-called L2 sensitivity, showing that the um, pool in E866 that prefers a smaller delta chi squared value when we increase the D bar over U uh, ratio is opposed by the experiments 160 and 104, which are here at DAS and uh, the NMC experiments. So therefore, uh, well, uh, the sequest experiment is clearly very important for us. And it tells us something very interesting about the E866 measurement as well. So there is an ongoing study to understand what will happen if we take out the E866 experiment in the, in the CT analysis and uh, for example, just re replace it by, by sequest. So, so you will see the result from the study in the next few months. Now, uh, this actually brings us to another major theme in this analysis, which I very briefly cover in the remaining three minutes. Um, well, we try to understand how well the LHC experiments agree among themselves and with other experiments in the CT18 data set. Now, this is obviously a very complex problem because uh, the experiments are so different and uh, there are so many factors affecting their agreement. Uh, however, we uh, do believe we arrived at, at a consistent answer. You have two yes. minutes now. Yes, uh, we arrived at a consistent answer by, by using four different approaches, so-called effective Gaussian variables, Lagrange multiplier scans, which are very slow, but most accurate. And then the two methods, which are, one of them is just the PDF reweighting method in EPUB, but also this method based on L2 sensitivity that uh, I showed an example in the previous slide, and it will be discussed in more detail uh, by uh, Sao Sang Jing uh, tomorrow uh, or in the afternoon. So what's the idea here? So the idea is the following. So if you take, we take this LHC experiments and put them in the global analysis, we find that uh, overall, they, do, they are not fitted as well as we hope. And especially this Atlas 7 ZW data is not fitted well. And now this creates problems for our analysis. And so if you think about uh, the, PD, the discussion of the PDF uncertainties 20 years ago, so the disagreements of experiments is a very difficult uh, statistical problem that have to be addressed, properly addressed, right? So now uh, the excellent fit is not just uh, the fit that gives you a good chi-squared, but you also, it must be also stable with respect to different selections of experiments. It must be stable numerically. It, it, it must pass a number of other qualities tests which together comprise what we, we call the strong set of goodness of fit criteria in this review paper with um, Dave and Carol. Now, if there are disagreements between experiments, actually realizing these conditions become more difficult. And that's the reason why we prefer CT18 and CT18X to CT18A and CT18Z, because there are substantial disagreements that run in, well, creates additional difficulties in realizing this program of uh, the strong goodness of it at uh, the, the, the test. Now, uh, I don't have time to discuss it, but for example, we can visualize this kind of um, issues using the Lagrange multiplier scan. And even if we, if we take the something very basic like the scan, scan on the alpha S value, you find that the experiments from different classes prefer some with different alpha S values. And so these disagreements can be tens of units of chi-square as you see in, in the slides. You could also look at some 
more detailed uh, uh, feeds, for example, or scans. And for example, you find that if you do a scan on, on RS, you find that the uh, Hessian uncertainties, either the, from the global approach, global tolerance approach, or especially from the dynamic tolerance approach, uh, underestimate the full range of delta chi squared, which will be normally associated with the, well, uh, let's see, more you should move squared. slowly to your but, conclusions, please. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, very good. So, so now, uh, uh, therefore, uh, we believe this issue is very important. And so, therefore, as we look forward, this is one of the issues that we asked to discuss. So, what do we do with the disagreeing experiments? How do we select them from the global analysis? Now, for example, the combined hero charm plus bottom data is precisely in that category. We would like to fit it, but we don't know how to get the good chi squared from it. Okay, so I will stop here. And so I encourage you to uh, listen to the other talks. And again, you, you see the, the list of topics that will be covered in the next few days on this slide. Thank you so much, Katarzyna. Thank you, Pavel, very much. I open the floor for questions. I see Amanda, uh, Mandy rising hand. Mandy, please. Uh, hi, Katarzyna, and hello, Pavel, obviously. Hello. I mean, Pavel, you know that uh, these Atlas WZ7TV data are very close to my heart, and uh, we've talked about it many times, but just in this forum to say that the MSHT recent PDFs and even the rather older NNPDF 3.1 have both included these data seemingly without having any significant problems. And so I just wonder, you know, how you can, how do you understand that in relation to the CT analysis, which clearly does have a difficulty with them? Well, uh, the, the, I think that the same issues are there in, in uh, MSHT and the NNPDF. And so again, we, we can look at the pools of this data and will clearly that there is some tension with NewTF, but in, in our case, it's also there is a tension with HERA. So that there is some dependence on um, uh, well, essentially the heavy flavor scheme that we use, right? So that that's becomes clear. But again, what I wish to point out is that whatever uncertainties we get from this uh, fit with RS. So if we use this data, it provides results in a smaller uncertainty band from the Hessian approach compared mm. to what we see from the Lagrange multiplier scan. And that's why we would like to be more conservative when we, for example, quoted uncertainty constraints, because we believe just like on the figure like you see here, that the actual uncertainty associated with strangeness is larger. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, I just wanted to, to say that, Thank thanks. You. Okay, are there any other questions? Oh, I see Uta raise her hand, please. Yeah, hi, hi Pavel and Katarina. Hey, so hey. this is certainly, very interesting. And as Mandy was saying, our WZ data from Atlas, the, those experimentally, they are extremely precise. Yeah. I don't know if we ever can beat this precision of this data. But what I'm questioning is really then the next, next leading order theory prediction. As you may well remember that I pointed out that the symmetric cuts that we are using imposed quite some problems into fixed order perturbative QCD prediction. And then, of course, there is the issue of PT resumation effects. Yeah, and also mm -hmm. the PT cut yeah. dependencies of the next and next leading order prediction. So what I was wondering if you perhaps underestimate the uncertainties in the theoretical predictions. And this may hamper, let's say, the smooth inclusion of our beautiful data into the PDF, uh, PDF world. Yeah, so, so I, I, I totally on the same page with you, Uta. So what, what I hope will happen, so we'll take this precise data and as Mandy said, it's a beautiful data and we really want to fit it. However, we do think that we need to understand the uncertainties better, right? Both from the theory side, maybe from the experimental side and that, that requires the manpower and interest. And so I, this, if we have this data, clearly this will be, uh, well, it can reduce the uncertainties once we understand it properly. Okay, I don't see any more raised hands and we should move forward. So thank you, Pavel, again. Thank you very much. We thank move you. To the second uh, speaker, the Sangva, and please share your slides with us. Um, Are you there? Okay. Yes, I'm here. Yes, can you hear good. me? Okay. Yes, I can hear you very well. Please share your slides. Okay. I will warn you two minutes before you are supposed to finish your talk. Okay. Please go ahead. All right, let me bring it up and start my clock. Um, okay, um, so I will talk about the um, CJ15 um, global PDF analysis with the um, new, new um, WMG data. Um, and also, um, 
um, discuss the little bit about the um, the um, the CCAS data that was recently released. Um, so I will mainly focus on the large X region um, and and flavor symmetry um, um, from our from from our study. So I will first go through briefly about the, the CJ um, framework and um, discuss about the our fits. So the CJ is the CTEC based um, and error QC analysis um, with particular focus on the large X and small Q scale region. Um, so to improve the um, the constraint on the large X region, um, so it used the um, much relaxed kinematic cuts um, than typical PDF analysis, um, which maximized the um, use of the fixed target BIS data uh, from Slack and, and JDAP. Um, and of course, it's important then to um, take into account the um, the proper theory correction, such as the higher twist or the target mass correction, um, and also the um, nuclear correction for the, the neutron data. Um, so the, the most recent um, public release of the CJ um, speech is CJ15. Um, and you can find the more detailed information about the um, this speech from the um, this PRD paper. Um, but I will also um, uh, briefly um, point out the our um, recent development and ongoing efforts since the um, CJ15 release. Um, the first is the um, we include the um, full JDAP 6GB data, um, as well as the WNG data from LAC. Um, at plus CMS and LACB. And also first time um, in the applied PDF analysis, um, we are including the big um, WG data um, that, was listed, that was published last year. Um, and of course, the, um, the Liang data are important for the, the sheep uh, works um, study. So these are, um, we are currently um, trying to um, um, in, include them into the, um, the tour, the um, new release of the CJ stage. Um, there is also an extensive study of the nuclear correction for neutron target. Um, I won't discuss um, here in my talk, but there will be talk by um, Xiao Xian in, in, in the afternoon in this um, working group session. Um, so you can, you can go listen to his talk. Um, and there is also the um, study for extracting the F2 uh, neutron structure function from the analyzing the, um, the DIS um, data, uh, which is actually in, in preparation for publication. Um, and also the CJ um, has done the impact study for the EIC um, um, that also went to the LR report. Um, and technical um, development um, that was implemented is that now the CJ framework is um, used the combination of the Apple grid um, as well as the traditional decay factor um, approach um, for the, um, um, the next meeting order corrections, which was implemented the, um, the Shoshan. Um, so. Okay, um, then I will go to um, the, um, the data set that CJ has. So the current CJ15 um, include the fixed target DIS from the proton and neutron target, as well as the, um, the uh, tag DIS um, data for free neutron structure functions. And then of course, there is the EP HERA collider DIS data um, and the Durian data from ES66. Um, is um, um, the, the strongest constraint on the, uh, the provide the strongest constraint on the the um, the sheep works at the large X region, um, and the W symmetry data from Tevatron, um, which is in particular sensitive to the deep work, um, and as well as the data jet data from from Tevatron, and the new data set as I mentioned is the full JDF six GB data, but we also um, try, um, study the um, new JDF twelve upgrade um, data. For example, the precision horse C um, at the structure function measurement and also the, um, the marathon, uh, the um, structure function ratio data, which used in your nuclei. Um, and in this talk, um, I will mainly focus on the, um, the RIC W data, as well as the um, the Young data from CCAS, which are sensitive to the sheep works at intermediate to large X region. Okay. Um, so, for the CJ, um, we also use the um, standard five parameter functional form. Um, and I won't discuss much about the, um, the, um, the parameterization much, um, but one thing that I want to point out is that the one distinct feature of the CJ15 um, parameterization is that the, it used the direct parameterization of the um, D bar over U bar ratio instead of the D bar minus U bar for the, for the C quarks. So it, it used the um, parameterization as you um, can I cannot use my cursor okay. um, in, in, in the slides. And also ensure that this ratio goes to one 
at, as the um, x approach to the to the one. Um, this is to accommodate the uh, uh, behavior at the large x, um, as it CJ15 include the um, ES66 data um, in the fit. Um, and recently, um, uh, CJ performed the study of the D bar minus U bar um, uh, um, shape using the extracted neutron structure functions um, with different um, parameterization for the for the C quarks as well as the um, impact of the different data sets, uh, which was published in the uh, physics uh, letter B uh, last year. Um, one of the parameterization we use in this, this paper discuss is this core CJ15A, um, which basically use the same data sets as the CJ15, uh, but with more conventional parameterization for the C, which is basically um, use this five um, parameter um, uh, functional form that was shown in the previous slide for um, D bar minus U bar as well. Um, and then um, it allows the um, D bar minus U bar um, goes to below one in some X region. So it's more uh, flexible compared to the CJ15. And as you can see in the plot here showing the D bar um, over U bar ratio as a function of X, um, comparing different parameterization. And CJ15 is the red um, and, and green is CJ15A. And as you can see that from the uh, much narrower, um, the, the uncertainty band that CJ15 is more um, um, less flexible and, and strict as it uh, has um, parameterizing the D bar by U bar directly there. And you can see that CJ15A um, that actually uh, goes to D bar by U bar below one um, around the X around 0.3 or so, which is because of the ES66 driving this. Okay, um, so the flavor asymmetry um, has been studied um, quite um, um, extensively. Um, and and um, obviously it's um, a quite um, important topic. And, and as the, we have the new CKS data, um, I'm sure it's gonna be more a very active discussion will, will come up. And as I can see that already discussed, being discussed in the several other PDF analysis. Um, so the ES66 data, um, which is shown in this plot, uh, the D bar by U bar extracted D bar by U bar from the um, cross-section ratio of the proton and, 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 and neutron target. Um, so these, these black data points that the, this ratio um, shows this very significant um, um, uh, asymmetry, but also the, this uh, interesting X dependence uh, behavior that around the X um, 0.3 or so, um, it shows some um, potential sign change of BD bar minus U bar as it goes below, uh, below minus one with large uncertainty. Um, this, of course, motivated the, um, the CKS experiment, which extend the X coverage up to um, 0.5 or so. Um, and obviously, the EA66 data is provided the strongest constraint on the bar U bar. So more data and independent and complementary um, uh, channel is, uh, is quite demanding. And besides the, um, the, the extension of the CKS, um, uh, the the, the Yang data, there is also the RIC data, which is um, the W data. So the WIC W um, Z data studied the impact in CJ15A um, uh, parameterization, which doesn't assume the, um, the D bar by U bar uh, goes to one at, at, at large X. Um, so it has recently published results um, in, in, in 2020, which include the DK lepton ratio as, uh, as a function of the lepton rapidity as well as the differential cross-section for the DK leptons and Z cross-section and the um, total cross-section of the W and Z. Um, you can see that the, um, these are the plot from this publication um, that show on the bottom that the lepton charge ratio and, and then cross-sections on the, on the right side. Um, you will hear more about this um, topic by uh, Jian um, on Thursday uh, by star collaboration. So the W bottom production in PP collisions, um, it provided very unique access to C quarks and also quark complementary um, to other observer as uh, such as the, um, the dual young or the, the same inclusive DIS. Um, is from the peribiolating, maximum peribiolating, violating weak interactions um, is the W only covers to um, left-handed quarks and right-handed quarks. Um, and right-handed antiquarks, um, from the charge of the W, um, you can distinguish the, um, the quarks and antiquark flavors. And the at leading order, um, this cross-section charge ratio 
um, can be written in terms of the and you and um, the flavor um, PDFs as you um, and at, especially at the mid rapidity this x1 and x2 are um, similar so this basically goes to um, you deep and, and deep over u bar ratio um, so from looking at this charge ratio, you can see that this is TV to the D over U bar. So um, from CJ, um, we compare the, include this um, data and compare the calculation with the data. Um, this shows here the differential cross section first. Um, the black data points um, are the star um, uh, from the paper, um, adding the, the statistics current systematic uncertainty in quadrature. Um, and the additional normalization certainty of about 9% is not um, shown here. Um, and you can see that CJ for W plus um, described the W plus cross section uh, reasonably well, um, except for the, 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 lot, the high, highest um, appearity point, um, which increased the high scale a little bit, but um, you can see that for, for other points, it is reasonab reasonably described. Um, for W minus, um, it, it doesn't quite well describe this uh, more um, steeper um, shape. Um, um, and, and also the data um, has much larger uncertainty. Um, um, so the, the new data sets um, with the um, similar statistical uncertainty uh, may help to um, look in that further looking at this uh, shape of the W minus um, and, and the calculation a little further better. Um, and from that, uh, there is a charge lepton ratio comparison, um, and, it, it, and, and as well as the G data as a function of the um, um, uh, Z that purity. Sorry, this is a typo for the Z. Um, and you can see that both um, um, are uh, recently described by the CJ15. Um, so we include this data in the CJ15A um, and looking at the impact. So this, these are the ratio um, at the top plot um, of this, um, the three by two um, is showing the ratio to the baseline say 15 a um, and the, the black is the base, base baseline with the 68 percent competent level um, uncertainty um, um, and the red and green are the, um, the fits with the star data, including either just lepton charge ratio and on, on top of that, including the W plus cross section and as well as the G cross section. I mean, you can see that for, I'm only showing this um, UND flavor and the, their ratio uh, only which are relevant for this data. Um, excuse me. Um, and, and the values are um, changing, but within the uncertainty. And to actually see more um, impact of this data on the, on the constraints, uh, looking at the bottom, which is relative error ratio, um, for the um, UND flavor and, and the ratio. And you can see that the, um, the star data is really the um, left and charge ratio, which is red curve, has a constraining power um, on the, um, and the D bar and U bar, also the D quark um, about up to 20%, um, 30% or so. Um, um, but the differential cross section and G data considering the, their large uncertainty, um, their addition of the their impact is, um, is limited. Um, and this data um, covers the range of the 0.1, x.1 to 0.3 roughly. Um, and, and as this is left on data, it's a little bit uh, more limited from the, the decay kinematics. Um, but, and then you can see that where it is actually data is sensitive around um, from the, um, the constraint um, of the reduction of the uncertainty. Um, this is also partially overwrap with the, um, the uh, EA6 data at different Q scale. So um, looking at the bar by U bar ratio more closely, the star data, um, we try to uh, look at the impact in, 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 in two different ways. One is the um, um, fitting the um, star data without the ES66 cross section um, and keeping the ES66 cross, ES66 cross sections. On the left, um, you can see that compared to the black baseline fit, which include this um, ES66 cross section, um, when we take it out and add star, of course, the error band um, uh, error bar is much larger, as you can see from the blue. Um, but the um, within the uncertainty in the region where um, they are consistent. But interestingly, that the um, the ES the this star data alone fits shows the um, much um, um, uh, it doesn't show the strong um, favor on these um, the the 
uh, sign change of the developments you were, which is- Dr. Mara, you have two minutes more. Ah, okay, thank you. Which is purely driven by this ea 6 this data. Um, on the right side, um, you can see when adding the star on top of ea 6 um, they are basically um, consist consistent um, and in deduction of the error bar you can see from here. And note, uh, should note that the X larger than around point, little less than point three, the star data doesn't um, constrain and it's purely um, extrapolation if there's no ES66. Okay, um, and more on the flavor symmetry. Um, the, this is the CKS result that was just released less than a month ago. Um, and it has been discussed also by Fabian as well that um, the new data um, suggests the, um, the, the ratio um, say above one um, and, and, and inconsistent um, with uh, show, showing the um, definition with the ES66 data. Um, we added um, the CKS data and, and did perform the preliminary pitch um, in, and also incorporating the spectrometer acceptance correction, which was provided this uh, nature paper um, on the, on the shown in the, the table on the left bottom. Um, and as the data points, the distribution itself is actually quite flat and, 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 this, and, and this looking at this ratio, um, this acceptance correction in fact is um, actually quite minimum. Um, so the right bottom shows the other preliminary fit of, and, and showing the extracted D over U bar ratio um, compared to the C15A baseline, um, as well as CKS alone, and as well as the um, adding the CKS, but taking out the S66 um, cross section, but adding the S66 ratio. So on the top table shows the what data is included, um, but basically red and green, you can see when CKS is added um, that the it pulls the, the fit uh, upwards um, and, and stay above one at even at larger X region. Um, and in this plot, um, so I also uh, say uh, plotting the DBR U bar ratio, um, but at the CKS kinematics and now compare the extracted um, DBR U bar from the, um, the CKS which is shown in the data point um, on the plot, um, adding the, um, the statistical and, and systematic errors um, in quadrature together in this plot. And you can see that the, um, our fits um, with the CCAS, um, they are consistent within the uncertainty with the data. Okay, um, so this is my summary. Um, so CJ now have a new data set included for the um, cheek fork um, uh, uh, constraint which is weak W data um, that provide the additional constraint around X around 0.1 or so in intermediate region, uh, which shows in agreement with the ES66 um, with the kinematic range um, where the data covers. Um, and the um, CKS data, which shows the, uh, the pulling the, the bar U bar ratio um, upward um, and, and the ratio stay above one. And we are um, currently pursuing the further detailed study with these data and preparing the um, a publication for that of the research. So, so for the for the CDA new release, um, we are working hard to toward the new release with the LHC data as well as the RIC and, stay, uh, and the CCAS. So um, please stay tuned. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I open the floor for the questions. I see Robert has raised hand, he said. Hi, yeah. Can I ask how much the chi square to the H66 and CQS deteriorate when you fix them at the same time as compared to just one or the other? Yes. Um, so the actually I didn't add it here, but the CQS, the, the, the chi square doesn't go that bad when we are uh, fitting the CQS and the um, ES6 together because I, it's mainly because the around the um, region that um, has um, in, inconsistency that the ES6 um, uncertainty is quite large. So it does uh, um, contribute to the increasing of a little bit of chi scare, but not much. Um, I, I don't have a number right now, but I can send you um, afterwards. Okay, I'd be interested to just see the numbers. Uh, thank you. Okay, and the other questions, I don't see raised hands, but if somebody wants to ask a question, please go ahead. I just have a quick comment. Uh, Sangwan, very nice talk. Uh, this is Arun. Oh, hi, Arun. Hello. Um, I just wanted to add that there's more data um, that's being analyzed that would uh, yeah. um, be added as a future publication to this uh, nature paper. Mm -hmm. um, 
in addition to this nature paper. So that should play, you know, it's more statistically significant than the 866 and it should uh, take over the shape um, yes. once that data is also included. Yes. But it's um, very nice to see that uh, there is agreement between um, your fits and the sequence data, yeah. Do, do you actually know uh, when do we expect this um, the new result? I know you, do, you just have a publication for this data, but... Um... So, sorry, say that again? Do you know when you uh, would ha expect these um, new data sets uh, would oh. have a result? Right. Um, I think we just got the first publication out yes. and the second uh, set of data, which is about uh, probably more than half of the data is undergoing uh, uh, data quality checks and so on. So it will take some time before we get out of the second publication. Okay, thank you. I see no more raised hands. So thanks again to the speaker. And now we will have talk by Emanuele who will tell us about the NNPDF 4.0 global fits. Could you please share your slides with us, Emanuele? You should be able to see my slides now. We do it's... see them, yes. So please start. I will remind you two minutes before the end of. Yeah, just to be sure, do you see my slide full screen? Yes. Okay, very good. So the additional subtitle to my talk is the structure of the proton to 1% accuracy. And therefore I would like to start from the end, basically uh, making a small comment about the NNPDF4, which is still a preliminary PDF set that we will uh, expect to release uh, before the um, summer break insofar as the precision is concerned. And in particular, in this first slide, you can see how precisions improved from the latest NNPDF release, which was an NPDF 3.1 at next to next to reading order, which appeared back in 2017, compared on the right with the preliminary NNPDF 4 release. And in particular here, I am looking at a quantity which is relevant for LHE physics, which is the part on luminosity computed at a center of mass energy of 13 TB and visualized in a, a B-dimensional plane as a function of the rapidity of a final state and of the invariant mass of the final state. And in particular, if you look uh, systematically at how the, the precision, the relative precision, on the luminosities is improved for quarks, for individual flavors. Here you have the UD bar, the DU bar, and then for gluon, here we have the GG luminosity, and here the GQ luminosity. You can see that there is a steady progress towards 1% relative uncertainty on the lumino on the person luminosity on a broad kinematic range. So the question that I will try to answer in my talk is basically how we are getting there. And in particular, that 1% precision, we believe does also correspond to 1% accuracy. So in order to explain how we get there, I have to explain what are the new ingredients that go into the new NNPDF4 release. And here is a summary of the experimental data in this scatter plot where you can appreciate the kinematic distribution in the x and q square uh, range of the plot of, of, of the um, accessed uh, region of the measurements. And in particular, the points with a black edge correspond mainly to LHC data sets that are new in an NPDF4 in comparison to an NPDF3.1. We looked at about 50 distributions, 50 different distributions that account for overall 400 new data points in an NPDF4. And more precisely here in this table, I have summarized the breakdown of all of the new data sets that are going into an NPDF4. So starting from the top of the table from processes that were already part of an NPDF 3.1, we are now including the combined reduced char and bottom cross section from HERA. We are including the ratio of daimuon over inclusive 
production measured by NOMAD. Concerning Dredgen, we include a bunch of data from ATLAS, in particular the final WNZ center and forward rapidity distribution 7TV. The double differential Z distribution at ATV, including for high mass, the W rapidity distribution at ATV, and the inclusive cross section for W and Z uh, at the team TV. As far as LHCB is concerned, we include the rapidity Z distribution, both in the Bay Electron and in the Lamont channel at the team TV. Concerning W plus charm, we include the A plus and CMS rapidity distribution at 7 and 13 TV, respectively. For single jet, we include the A plus double differential measurements at ATV. And concerning top pair production, we included total inclusive cross section from CMS at 5 TV and a bunch of differential distributions double from uh, CMS and uh, single from CMS at the TNTV. We also include a bunch of new processes which were not considered in NTDS 3.1, in particular single top production, the top to anti-top total cross-section ratio from 8 plus 7, 8 and 13 TV, the normalized rapidity of the top and rapidity of the top bar distribution at 7 and 8 TV from 8 plus, and a similar measurement from CMS at 7 and 8 and 13 TV. We also include a W plus jet measurement, in particular the PT distribution at ATV from Atlas, the isolated photon measurement distribution at 13 TV from Atlas, and a bunch of digit measurements from both Atlas and CMS and 7 and 8 TV. And finally, we also consider DAS plus jet production from H1. Note that the data set with an asterisk will be considered by means of reweighting and therefore they are not entering any of the results that I will be discussing in the following. And also the uh, experiments with the cross for which uh, the NNLOK factors have been computed only very recently will be included only in a next reading order state. Concerning the methodological ingredient, we made some significant progress. In particular, we refined the theoretical framework by including nuclear uncertainties for both deuteron and heavy nuclei by default. We are now including NNL low charm quadric massive corrections, which are relevant to analyze a moon uh, production data. We do not include electroweak corrections by default, but we carefully check the size in comparison to the size of the experimental data. And if needed, we exclude data points where these are large. And as in NNPDF 3.1, the charm PDF is parametrized on the same footing as the other PDFs. We also adopt an improved implementation of the PDF properties. In particular, we extended the positivity constraint for light quark and antiquark and glue and PDFs by requiring positivity of PDFs and not just positivity of contour cross sections. And we also uh, impose explicitly the integrability of non singlet like quark PDF combinations. We are using a new parameterization whereby now we delegate to a single neural network the parameterization of the eight independent PDF combinations. We do this independently in the flavor in the involution basis, and we check that results are indeed uh, equivalent, statistically equivalent. And we use a new optimization strategy based on gradient descent rather than genetic algorithm, which has the advantage of speeding up significantly the fitting procedure. And of course, we have to choose a significant amount of details of the minimization, like for example, the specific minimization algorithm that we use and its detail, like the learning rate and so on and so forth. And we do this in an automatic way by means of hyper-optimization, where basically we fit the fitting methodology by uh, defining uh, the optimal choices of all of these parameters. Our uncertainties, our PDF uncertainties are validated by means of multi-closure tests as we did in NPDF 3.1 in the data region. And in the extrapolation region, we use future tests where, whereby we test the uh, predicting power of uh, uh, the PDF that we obtain on subset of uh, uh, data points that were not included in the PDF set. 
And finally, we also developed a more efficient contraction tool for PDF set delivery. Of course, each of these topics will deserve a talk in itself, and indeed, some of these will be a part of dedicated talks, in particular, nuclear production will be discussed by Rosalind Pearson later today. And tomorrow, electro correction and positivity will be discussed respectively by Christopher and Felix. Concerning the fit quality, here is a summary of our preliminary candidate NNL of fit. As you can see, the chi-square over about 4,500 points is acceptable. And if we look at the individual sets, we immediately see two exceptions. The first one is a description of the charm legacy error data. And we believe that the suboptimal chi-square, which is also found by MSHT20, for example, here is due possibly uh, 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 of uh, is possibly due because of lack of small x resumation. And in the case of Atlas, we also see a poor description of the top payer production data. And this comes mainly from a poor description of the uh, A to TV uh, top payer rapidity differential distribution, which are included in the fit as we did in the case of and NPDF 3.1. And in this specific case, the chi-square is of the order of three. As a general remark, as statistical uncertainties become smaller, a good control of systematic uncertainties and their correlation becomes fundamental to interpret the sensibleness of the fit and in particular, the sensibleness of the chi-square. Now looking at the results here, I compare the quark quark, the quark anti-quark and the gluon gluon luminosity at 14 TV as a function of the invariant mass of the final state for the NNPDF 3.1 and NNPDF 4 uh, results. They, of course, differ both in the data set and in the methodology. What you can see is that there is a fair consistency, except perhaps a deviation at the level of one sigma in the QQ bar and in the gluon gluon luminosity. However, you can see that the chi square of the NNPDF 4 a determination is slightly better. Now, what if you compare instead the uh, NNPDF4 and the NNPDF3.1 methodology on the same data set and specifically on the, on the same NNPDF4 data set, you can clearly see that the two determinations are consistent, but again, we conclude that NNPDF is more accurate because we can achieve a better global chi-square. And of course, we also obtain reduced uncertainties. And of course, here, because uh, the data set is the same, but the methodology is different, the improved uh, uh, precision in uncertainty is due to the methodology. Looking specifically at each of the uh, partons, here, for example, I focus on the gluon, and I look slightly more closely at the impact of the data, and in particular, I compare the NNPDF for fit always in green with variance from which I remove uh, the jet data, from which I remove the top data in the left hand side plot, and here in the right hand side plot, I remove the ZPT data and I remove the direct photon data. And as you can see, the bulk of the effect is driven by the jet data which uh, basically uh, 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 suppress a little bit the gluon in the medium X region or enhance it otherwise. The ZPT data uh, has a comparably smaller impact and likewise also the top data have a comparably smaller impact uh, respectively focalized at large X and, and intermediate values of X, while direct photon is uh, almost immaterial. Concerning jets, I should emphasize the fact that we decided to include digit data, given their greater theoretical accuracy and the avoidance of the correlation models, which instead affect may affect the interpretation of the single inclusive jet data. 
And that choice was based on an extensive study that we did in the context of the NNPDF 3.1 determination for details of CDS reference. But basically, in this plot, you can compare an NNPDF 3.1 uh, fit without jet data with single inclusive jet data and uh, with uh, digit data. And as you can see that broadly speaking, the impact of single inclusive jets on digits is broadly consistent with the single inclusive jets perhaps being slightly more precise. Now, moving to the quark flavor decomposition here, I have just summarized in three different plots, our knowledge of U, D, U bar and B bar quarks, again, with uh, 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 data set variants of the NNPDF4 fits. In particular, I compare the, again the usual baseline fit, a fit without LHCB data, and a fit without the ATLAS and CMS W and Z boson production data. Of course, no significant difference is seen at the level of the UPDF, given that it is constrained by uh, the bulk of the data, so basically by inclusive DAS data. If we look at the D distribution instead, we can see the impact of the LHCB data at large X. And if we look at the anti-quarks, we can see a significant impact of the uh, ATLAS and CMS, W and Z data. Now, uh, for the third time, I should this afternoon I should flash on the sequest asymmetry and here is just a, a qualitative data theory comparison between an NPDF 3.1 and NPDF 4 and the sequest analysis for the D bar over U bar ratio and as you can see at least qualitatively the candidate and NPDF 4 set uh, is able to describe the sequence data that have been recently released. Manuela, now, you have two minutes left. Yes, I'm almost done. Let me just comment on the strange PDF, and in particular, again, the impact of the data. Uh, here we compare the NNPDF 3.1, the NNPDF 4, and an intermediate uh, uh, fit, uh, which, call, which is called NNPDF 3.1 strange, which included uh, uh, more or less the same strangeness sensitive data in an NPDF4, but uh, uh, was performed with the NNPDF 3.1 methodology. And as you can see here, the effect of the data and of the methodology is to uh, enhance basically the strange and anti strange, which, however, remains if you look at the uh, momentum uh, uh, fraction of the uh, sequence over of the strange quark over C quarks remain compatible with most of the other determination that is definitely more accurate. And finally, let me uh, briefly comment on this uh, uh, charm uh, PDF, which is parameterized on the same footing as other PDFs. We here, for example, you can see a comparison between the baseline and NPDF4, a variant of the NNPDF4 fit, which includes the E and C data, which are historically claimed to be sensible to charm, and then a, a version of the NNPDF4 baseline fit with the turbative charm. Uh, here you can see the char momentum fraction as a percentage of the momentum carried by charm quarks at 100 GD, and a comparison between for the QQ bar luminosity between a perturbative and a fitter charm version of the NNPDF4 fits. And as you can see, basically a, a, a fitting charm or not fitting charm implies a distortion of the fit, and but uh, uh, not at the detriment of an inflation of the uncertainties and also a general improvement of the ties. So let me now conclude yeah, and okay. say that NNPDF4 is the next generation Python set of the NNPDF family. It achieves 1% accuracy in an unprecedentedly broad kinematic range by consistently improving the previous NNPDF 3.1 Python set. This result builds upon an extensive LHC dataset combined with deep learning optimization models. 
Its faithfulness in representing PDF uncertainty is completely validated by closure tests. And of course, 1% PDF uncertainties challenge the accuracy of theoretical predictions and demand an increasing effort towards a systematic inclusion in the fit of theoretical uncertainties. No clear higher order physical parameters and higher order QCD and electrode corrections. And last but not least, let me emphasize that the NNPDF code used to produce all of the results that you have seen, including plots, will be made publicly available with its documentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emanuele. I open the discussion. Actually, this last point on your talk, uh, it's uh, quite nice. It's surprising, but uh, I am looking forward to see that. And maybe- Yeah, the, the idea is uh, also in the, con well, our idea is to make the code public with a double purpose. The first one is of course, uh, easing, benchmarking which is something that is definitely needed if you really want to achieve such small uh, such a small precision and the mm -hmm. second uh, uh, goal is of course a service goal which is to make it easier to include new data sets or perform specific studies with specific data sets yeah i'm looking forward to it i see uta has a raised hand please uta yeah, thank you very much for this really nice update. And this is, of course, looks very promising. In particular, I'm pleased to learn that you get the positivity constraints, which is uh, quite sensible. Anyway, you mentioned that you are not including higher order electrolyte corrections. And perhaps uh, I may need to understand better what you mean with this. For instance, with Atlas, of course, we are doing the QED. Um, corrections, but we don't have all the virtual corrections. And this is where we have to, of course, correct our predictions for, because this yes. is really yeah. the data. So that's why I was not sure what you were referring to specifically with your comment. Okay. Uh, so uh, in general, as a general remark, I would strongly encourage you to attend the talk by Christopher Schwann uh, tomorrow in the uh, uh, electronic working group uh, who will talk more uh, extensively about all of these. But of course, there are very, if so, uh, in general, there are various uh, uh, sources of electronic corrections uh, uh, which we have to care about, correct? There are initial state corrections which are directly related to, with the photon PDFs, for example. And then there are also final state radiation corrections, right? Uh, what we do here is in particular check that the final state radiation corrections are, uh, which by the way, are usually subtracted from the experimental data, are not large enough and also initial state radiation are not uh, enormously large or so large to jeopardize the analysis. So the, anal the accuracy of the theory which is used to uh, analyze the data is next to next to leading order pure QCD. No electronic correction of any kind are included. Of course, yeah, the goal exactly, will be this to- is not correct. This is not correct because you're missing the virtual correction. You're missing the loops which are not in, because this is what we are not correcting for the data. But thank you. I will I will try if I can connect to the talk you, you referred to. Okay. I see no more raised hands. Is there anybody who would like to ask a question? It seems like Simone has his hand up. Yes, actually. indeed. Uh, thanks. Um, so um, well, my first one was actually the same point of Uta, but maybe one step further. I'm somehow puzzled by how you can fit, you know, jets at high PT or these super precise Rayan data without these virtual corrections. Because I mean, in some bins, you may have corrections which are actually sizable with respect to the experimental precision. So I would expect this to have a, to give a sensible bias to the PDFs. But okay, I guess um, this will also be forwarded to the next uh, um, talk yeah, on the subject. Um, my other question is on slide nine. So you show an NPDF for uh, removing WZ data from Atlas and CMS, and you see that it shifts quite a lot in some PDFs. I was wondering what is it that constrains those PDFs in that X range 
when you remove the atlas, um, so this WZ data. So if you have in mind which data set is actually constraining this beyond this N WZ. NMC, I would say, fixed start NMC okay. on Thanks. proton and deuteron. Thanks. Yeah, because the, the uncertainty doesn't change too much with or without. But uh, the that's central true. value shifts quite a lot. That's true. That's true. And, and uh, we believe that, this is, that, that there is uh, an underlying inconsistency between ATLAS and NMC. We uh, try to investigate whether this could be attributed from the fact that we are underestimating a deuteron correction in the NMC data. We do include by default deuteron correction in all of these states. So therefore we concluded that uh, that's not the reason for the inconsistency. Okay, thanks. Okay, any more questions? I don't see the hands. So we will now uh, continue with the talks and next uh, will be uh, Simone on behalf of the Exfitter group and he will tell us about the PDF analysis of the Z boson polarization data and uh, constraints on the Higgs uh, cross section. So uh, please uh, start now. I will remind you two minutes before your talk ends. Thank you. I hope you can see the slides. Everything is fine, yes. Good, so I will give you um, a very short overview of the XFITER project, and then I will go in to, towards our latest study, which is uh, a study of longitudinally polarized bosons uh, and the relation to the Higgs cross-section at LHC and Hayumi LHC. Um, so as you probably know, um, XFITER is uh, an open source, and so far, uh, the only open source uh, QCD fit framework. So it allows for exaction, extractions of PDFs, but also to oppose theory uh, evaluate the impact of new measurements on existing PDFs, either through Hessian profiling or Bayesian rating. Um, one can use it to evaluate consistency uh, across uh, different experimental data. And also it has tools to evaluate uh, various theoretical assumptions, so parametrizations or whatever else. So, so far it has been used uh, to produce over 80 publications uh, on a broad variety of subjects, uh, somewhat all related to QCD. And it's also the tool of choice for uh, studies related to PDFs uh, um, for by the LHC collaboration, so Atlas and CMS. Um, the latest release is uh, version 2.0.1, uh, um, which is uh, just an incremental update with a few updated dependencies, plus uh, mostly bug fixes. And uh, um, I just here advertise a bit, uh, you know, the website where you can find all of the information and the mailing list for feedback and, uh, and help. And just to say also that we are in the progress uh, of uh, a large overhaul of the, the code base. Uh, so this is mostly so far on, uh, um, on from the technical point of view, but we also expect them to move towards adding uh, new features. And this is ongoing in the master version. Um, so just a few highlights of uh, recent results. Um, so the um, last, so this was 2019 uh, result from the Exit Fitter um, developer group is a determination of the Pion PDF. Um, you can see here highlighted a couple of results, so the valence and the gluon PDFs. Uh, you can also see that um, this determination agrees with uh, the GEM fit, although um, we do find uh, somewhat larger uncertainties. And this is due to the choice of, uh, of data sets and the fact that uh, some PDF combinations are uh, um, so turn out to be correlated, so you cannot really unambiguously determine them without more data. Um, and then a couple of highlights from the LFC collaboration. So on the left, you see a recent fit of um, PDFs uh, uh, using Dryan data, and um, in particular, including WZ plus one part on data. Um, and you can see in the plot the relative impact on the, the strangeness. I believe this will be shown in this conference in a, in a later talk. And then also a recent study from CMS where they used XFITTER for a simultaneous determination of alpha S, the top mass, and the gluon PDF using top quark multidifferential uh, data. Um, okay, so um, now I will move to the main subject of this talk. Um, so as we all know, the characterization of the Higgs sector is uh, one of the main goals of the LHC and the Hailumi LHC physics program. And um, the uncertainties, uh, so the theory uncertainties in general, and more specifically the uncertainties from the PDFs are an important limiting factor. So you see this plot, which has been shown already, I think a few times from the Hailumi High Energy uh, Yellow Report where you see that the dominant uncertainty for uh, gluon gluon fusion uh, X cross section comes from the PDFs and the mismatch between the PDF and the um, theory prediction sorter. 
So it's essential somehow to uh, bring these uncertainties down if we really want to exploit the LXC to its uh, fullest potential. And so far, um, this uh, room PDF is mostly constrained by DIS data. Um, we, of course, uh, have seen that in this uh, global feeds, uh, jets and top world production data um, do play a role. Um, however, they are also, um, so they suffer from somehow um, issues in both the measurement themselves, which are difficult and subject to large uncertainties, and they're also difficult to predict with very high accuracy. And the NNLO for uh, both of these processes came out uh, only recently. And here I just highlight a couple of recent studies uh, where they somehow highlight some of the issues uh, in interpreting those data. So if you just think this is uh, theoretical, uh, this plot was shown yesterday, and I think uh, it was made by Lucian uh, last year. It shows the evolution in the agreement between the global fits on the uh, gluon gluon luminosity. And you can see that with the modern version of the PDFs, um, while the uncertainties went down a little bit, uh, the agreement between the various fit did not. So um, it, it would be ideal to have somehow a way to unambiguously determine the gluon uh, with small uncertainties in the future. And this is somehow um, what we try to do. Um, so our goal has been to consider whether electroweak boson production could provide a handle to constrain Higgs cross sections. And um, now I go back to a bit of theory introduction. So as you know, um, the angular distribution of the decay leptons in Dreyan production are somehow a way to probe the production dynamics. Um, and one can explicit, make this explicit uh, through this um, angular decomposition. Um, so this is a decomposition that is valid to all order in uh, QCD into uh, nine angular coefficients or elicity cross sections, and these are called the AI. Um, so you see the full expression for the cross section of the young production, uh, so the five dimensional in uh, PT, rapidity mass, cos theta and phi, where cos theta and phi are um, usually measured in the Collins over frame. And apologies for the typo to solve. Um, uh, so you see that this can be expressed as an unpolarized uh, cross-section, which depends on PT rapidity mass, and then these elicity cross-sections. So here you should notice, uh, uh, so this one plus cos squared theta, which is just, if you want, an overall normalization factor. And then you have A0, which is the longitudinal cross-section, A1, interference between longitudinal and transverse, A2, the transverse component, um, A3, another QCD piece, A4, which is basically the forward backward symmetry, so sensitive to, um, the Weinberg angle, and then these further terms, which are small and only appear to higher orders. Um, the A4 coefficient, as I said, is parity violating, it's sensitive to the Weinberg angle, so sine square theta W effective leptonic, and is also sensitive to the flavor non singlet PDS. Um, so, in full phase space of the decay leptons, uh, this A4 is directly related to the forward backward asymmetry by this coefficient. And um, the sensitivity to the, to the PDFs of A4 has been explored in a previous ex fitter study, which I just summarized briefly. Um, so you can see here um, the constraints on uh, PDF. So this is a, a, a profiling exercise using as baseline PDF CT14 and NLO, and uh, assuming pseudo data as a function of mass for the forward backward asymmetry for different increasing uh, integrated luminosity. So corresponding to what is basically the current LFC data set, uh, uh, the full LFC data set, and the Hayumi LFC data set. And you can see that for a certain combination of valence PDFs, you do see a significant uh, reduction in PDF uncertainties. And in particular, you see the largest reduction for U valence, but also a sizable reduction in D valence. And in particular, what was highlighted in this study is the specific combination which drives the asymmetry, which is two-third U valence plus one-third D valence. Uh, the improvement is mostly in the low and the intermediate X region. Um, so looking at the rapidity dependence, one can further enhance uh, PDF sensitivities, and this is particularly true for the down quark uh, valence PDF. Um, you see here in the plot, uh, uh, still profiling, this time using as baseline PDF, um, HERA PDF 2.0 um, for the D valence uh, PDF uh, and on the right for the C. And you can see that, um, so you, you get um, increased uh, sensitivity, sorry. Um, for the valence, and that if you go to very high rapidities for the, the vector boson, um, you have some improvements, but this is mostly in the high X region. And the, region, the reason you don't have improvements um, in other X regions is mostly due to the limited statistics that you can collect, you can collect at such high rapidity. OK, so now coming back to A0. Um, A0 is parity conserving and is sensitive to the flavor singlet PDF. So we may think it may help for the gluon. So it's, uh, it can be re-expressed as the ratio of the longitudinal to the unpolarized cross-section. 
And uh, uh, the measurement itself is done um, simply by looking at leptons. So one doesn't test the issues uh, of, uh, you know, color final states one has when measuring jets and top. So it can be measured very accurately. It can also be predicted very accurately since it's not current, currently known to NNLO and QCD. And you see here um, on the right, the NNLO jet predictions against the Atlas ATV measurement. Uh, you see that uh, it shows a remarkable uh, perturbative convergence. Um, more recently, NLO electroweak corrections have, as a function of PT have been uh, computed, and they also show that, uh, but for the low PT region, uh, these are also very small. Um, so if we look now at the different partoni subchannels uh, and how they contribute to A0, uh, we see that um, these have different behaviors as a function of PT. So here in the plots, you can see the ZPIC region in the top right, um, um, the forward rapidity ZPIC region in the bottom right, and the low mass uh, uh, but central rapidities at um, the bottom left. Um, so uh, the point to uh, be taken from this plot is that since you have a different distribution from, uh, um, say, the core quark, uh, the QQ bar, and the core gluon uh, channels, you can imagine that by measuring uh, this A0 coefficient, um, you can somehow distinguish these two contributions uh, and constrain the, the quark over gluon ratio. So the largest sensitivity comes from the region where the second derivative of this uh, A0 over PT is, uh, is equal to zero. So where you have the largest slope, and this is around uh, you know, 90 GB for the, the peak region, and it's uh, slightly shifted when you go to lower masses. Um, so the first thing we did was to look at um, existing measurement of this A0 coefficient. So this has been first measured at the Tevatron, and then also at the LHC by Atlas and uh, CMS at ATD. We only considered the Atlas measurement, which is the only, so the, it's the most precise one. And it comes in uh, three bins. Um, we only considered the bins with PT greater than 11.4 GB, this corresponds to the bin boundary, and we used predictions at order alpha strong square um, using um, Apple grids uh, from uh, Matka 5 AMC at NLO. Um, so we took uh, care of um, including all um, covariance experimental matrices for you know, statistical systematic uncertainties and migration across uh, rapidity bins. And you can see now the description of the data in the, in the plot here, and also the chi-square in the, in the table on the left for um, selection of modern PDF sets. Um, so, the plot maybe is not so illustrative. I mean, one can get a um, good description of the data, but how good? So if you look at the chi-square, it's basically um, very good for all of the modern PDFs. Um, now, the, the thing that is not shown here, but you can believe me, is that um, unfortunately, we didn't find significant constraints uh, on the PDFs themselves using this data. Um, so this said, we, we, we started to study whether the um, huge statistics that we expect at Hayumi LHC can actually change this picture. So we generated pseudo data um, for this A0 quantity as a function of PT, at 13 TV for 300 firm in, um, inverse femtoban and for uh, three inverse atoban. And now um, with this increase of statistics, you actually see a sizable reduction in the PDF uncertainty. So this is shown for different PDF combinations in the, in the plot here. And uh, as baseline PDF, uh, we use the, the newer CT, so CT18 and NLO. Um, so you see that the largest constraints, uh, um, well, you believe me that the largest constraints come from these four PDF combination and also in the region between uh, of X between 10 to the minus three and 10 to the minus one. Uh, most of the gain uh, comes when uh, using this pseudo data for 300 inverse Fentoban. Although if you look at the difference between the 300 and inverse Fentoban and triatoban, you see that the um, U bar and D bar are further constrained. So that still uh, gives some improvement. And something else we did um, was to actually check that the profiling results are stable under variation in the perturbative scales, um, which they do. And actually they're almost unchanged, somehow confirming this uh, perturbative stability of A0. So the fact that uh, we have uh, predictions that we can actually trust. So it's now interesting to look at this other um, kinematical region, which I also showed uh, um, before where I looked at the partonic subchannels. So the first one is, uh, is that of low invariant masses. Um, so uh, between JPSI and Upsilon. Um, what we, have, we see here is that we are sensitive to the gluon PDF at very small x, so x uh, smaller than 10 to the minus three. So this is an interesting range uh, to be sensitive to, and it could possibly be of relevance for things like TMD PDFs. 
And the other range we explored is, uh, is that of forward dialecton rapidity. So if you want the LHCB phase space, so the Z boson rapidity between two and uh, 4.5. And what we found here is additional sensitivity to C core PDFs at X of around 10 to the minus three. So from here, we move to the evaluating the impact on actually the Higgs cross section and the Higgs uncertainties. So the first thing we produced are the gluon gluon luminosity plot as a function of, uh, of the mass of the object produced. And this is shown in the top left. This is a 13 TV with um, our profile PDF and the baseline one. And you can see now, if you look at the uh, masses at around 125 GV uh, with the three atom result that the uncertainties are, uh, are, are basically halved, which is uh, something we were also surprised to see. And it's very nice, obviously. Um, so from there, we computed the um, Higgs boson rapidity at next to leading order using MCFM. And this is for the gluon gluon fusion. And you can basically see the same picture um, if you look at central rapidities. Of course, at higher rapidities, things are slightly different. You explore uh, different X ranges. And finally, we computed the total cross section at NQ below. Uh, this is with uh, GG Higgs. Um, this time, looking also at the impact of this um, pseudo data um, using different baseline PDFs, so not uh, just the CT18. Um, NNLO of before, but also an NPDF 3.1 NNLO and the newer MSHT20 um, NNLO. So for these three sets, uh, you see uh, different but somewhat, somewhat similar behavior. So you still get a significant reduction. It seems to be smaller for um, an NPDF 3.1 and MSHT20, uh, but it's still uh, sizable. It's left. Yes. And uh, the next step we did, since this is a um, sensitivity projection for high luminosity, uh, we do expect, of course, um, um, additional LHC measurements to actually say something about the gluon uh, or in general PDFs and say something about the Higgs cross section PDF uncertainties. Um, so these were incorporated in, um, in the yellow report studies in this PDF for LHC 15 uh, um, scenario one and scenario two projections, which include pseudo data for future top and jet measurements. And um, we looked what would happen after including, in addition to those, also our own pseudo data. And while, of course, now the decrease in, um, in uncertainty is, uh, is reduced with respect to the current uh, PDF uncertainties, it is still a non zero uh, improvement. So, given the fact that uh, this data we expect it to uh, be measured uh, more precisely and be predicted more uh, precisely, uh, so hope, hopefully this could still be of use and also be of use in. Um, so an alternative to these other processes. And this brings me to my conclusions already. Uh, so we um, presented this uh, proposal for a novel determination of the gluon PDF using measurements of the Young angular coefficient A0. So this is a color singlet process which can be measured only using uh, um, leptons. Uh, we observed a significant reduction in the gluon PDF uncertainties, uh, visible even when we use projected PDF sets based on the full high lumi LHC data sample. And this translates into an important reduction on the cross-section uncertainties for the uh, gluon gluon Higgs production. Now, the natural next step uh, would be an extension to a fit uh, of the full set of angular coefficients. We expect further sensitivity to um, PDFs from the A1 and the three coefficient, and also from a combination with A4, which while not sensitive to the gluon PDF directly, will uh, be sensitive to the C4 PDFs and so uh, indirectly may also help, you know, uh, constraining the gluon. And this was all, thanks. Thank you very much, Simona. We can open the discussion. Are there any questions for the speaker? I don't see any hands, so please just start if you have a question. Okay. Maybe, uh, okay please yeah hi yeah very nice talk so is there an overlap between a naught and the pt of the z just a very naive question in terms of so you've done you know you've done studies in terms of a naught but if the same data were presented in, in that way um maybe i missed that so what, what you're asking if there is an overlap between the a0 uh, pseudo data and the fiducial pt uh, z measurements that you already used well i mean not so much that, but if you had the same, I guess they're kind of complementary, or as you say, that A0 is zero at leading order, right? So in a sense, it's yes. sort of the same so, kind of thing. 
I mean, what, uh, what enters a fiducial cross-section measurement of PTZ is the unpolarized cross-section, but also all of the angular coefficients, right? Mm -hmm. um, since they affect the way in which your fiducial cuts um, play a role, uh, so somehow shape the CPT. Um, so now, uh, I think what you refer to more specifically is this unpolarized cross-section, which is orthogonal to a zero. Mm -hmm. And in this sense, there is no overlap. Okay. If I understood your question. Oh, I, yeah, I think so. It's just a very naive thing. Okay, do we have any more questions? I don't hear anything, so uh, thank you again, Simona. And then we will have Robert uh, telling us about the MSHT 2020. Robert, could you please share your slides with us? Yeah, is that? Let me put it on to. Oh, is that okay? Yes, and uh, I maybe you go to full screen, and then I will remind you two minutes before your talk should end. Ah, I thought I was on full screen. Am I not? You are. Yeah, well, okay. full screen for me. I was confused. I'm sorry. Please <laughs> okay. start and I will remind you two minutes before the end. Okay, thanks. So I'm going to give a very quick uh, discussion or a presentation of these new PDFs. Now, it's very quick because it's a 140 page paper, uh, if you actually have looked at it. Uh, it's accepted for publication now, so it's going to appear very, very soon, so after some rather minor revisions. So uh, even though I'm going to skip through quite a lot of the content of this talk quite quickly, then if you want to read through it, it's still a considerably quicker introduction to the highlights than the full paper. So first of all, I'd explain why it's MSHT. Uh, this is now meant to be a permanent naming convention because otherwise it was just getting too complicated and changing far too frequently. And it can be taken to stand for mass scheme because we've been using a general, a general uh, flavor mass scheme uh, for longer than anyone else in PDF fitting. Uh, Hessian, since we produce our PDF aerosets in the Hessian uh, and also tolerance, since we use tolerance rather than the simple delta chi squared of one. So obviously, of course, it also includes many of the initials that have appeared in previous sets, so there's some continuity as well. So there are many new theoretical developments, though the most important of these is probably the change in the parametrization, and in particular the D bar over U bar, and we then get uh, a rather different strange quark, and we've extended the parametrization for that a lot. But we extended the parametrization the eigenvector sets of green and yellow, some of them for data sets that we've already included previously, but also for uh, completely new data sets where the data and the NNLO uh, predictions have only recently become available. So we include lots of new LHC data, but also final HERA and Tevatron data sets. And we, um, so I'll talk about these, the most important of these. And we have some problems with correlated uncertainties. Some of the other uh, earlier talks have hinted at and um, some tensions in data sets. We also find that NLO is no longer sufficient for real precision. So our theoretical procedures, I'll go through this very quickly because there's really not much change here. We use the same variable for the general mass variable for the number scheme as previously. We use deuteron and heavy nuclear corrections for the deuteron and nuclear uh, target data. Again, this is Robert, very Robert, yes. excuse me, you, you are uh, falling out a little bit. Maybe you can turn your camera off that they will, could help the bandwidth. Let's see if it is better then. Okay, does that sound better? It actually does sound better. Please continue. Okay. Okay, so the... Um, Nuclear corrections are taken from a global fit elsewhere, uh, although we add an uncertainty to that, and we also have our own deuterium corrections. Uh, we fit data with systematic uncertainties using either nuisance parameters or a correlation matrix, but we would prefer to use nuisance parameters. This is our preferred method if that's uh, what's made available. And we also prefer to fit to absolute cross sections in preference to normalized gain if both are presented. So, 
So let me go through some of the most important theory corrections. So we now have NNLO corrections to time muon production. So time muon, as we've already heard, is one of the constraints of the strange quark. We now have other constraints from W and Z data we are going to talk about. And these NNLO corrections are important because they're both quite large, about 10% or more, and also negative, which means that you would expect, you think, more strange quark, which is what the Atlas uh, w and Z data actually want. So they should relieve the tension between the Daimu 1 data and the LHC W and Z data. And we find that to a certain extent they do. They don't actually improve the fit to the Daimu 1 data very much, but they do allow this good fit to happen with a branching ratio of um, charm, which is produced from the strange muons, which is in better agreement with the measured value, uh, which is input into the fit, albeit with an uncertainty. It also reduces the tension between fitting uh, with or without this Atlas W and Z data. We still get a larger strange quark if we fit with it than without it, but the tension, as you can see on the right compared to the left, is reduced a little bit by these time one corrections. Nearly all other data is now also fitted in in a row. Um, so the only exception to this is the CMS uh, W plus charm jet data, which have only NLO theory, but we still include it. It carries very little weight, but it's an extra constraint on the strange quark, which is one of our most uh, uh, one of the quarks which is of most interest in these new studies. So in particular, we include NLO cross sections for jets and for top cross section, uh, and this allows us to include a much wider variety of data than previously. We also include the electroweak corrections where possible, and if they've not already been subtracted from the data supply, which they have been sometimes. So big change is an increase and an improvement in our parameterization. We did a study many years ago where we showed how many parameters you needed in the polynomial of uh, expansion for the PDFs in order to get a certain amount of precision if you use Chebyshev polynomials, which themselves are designed in order to give you good convergence when you write a uh, polynomial parameterization of a function. And what we found then was that if you use four Chebyshev polynomials, you get the sort of light green level of precision here for a general PDF type uh, shape if you try and fit it using a polynomial with a certain number of parameters. So you can be wrong by about 1% if you use four polynomials, but if you use six polynomials, then you're generally correct at the level of well under 1%. So in other words, in order to be both precise and accurate to well under 1%, you need six polynomials in a parameterization of a PDF. Four polynomials or fewer will give you 1% errors or bigger. So that means that we've improved our parameterization now that we want to get to the level of 1% or less uh, by extending from four polynomials, or in some cases, even slightly fewer than that for some PDFs, to six polynomials in pretty much all of our PDFs, other than S minus S bar, where there's very little constraint and where some people just set that equal to zero anyway. So we used to have 36 parameters in MSHD 2014. Now, because each of our PDFs is now a normalization, the one minus X power at large X and X power at small X, and then in general, six polynomials, then each one is parameterized by either eight or sometimes uh, some, either nine or sometimes eight if one parameter is constrained by a sum rule parameters. So overall, we have 51 PDF parameters. So that's an increase of 15 compared to our previous set. We find improvements in the chi-squared from uh, improve. Well, one thing I should also note is that we also now parameterize D bar over U bar rather than D bar minus U bar, which we previously did. So we look at how the chi-squared improves as we go through each of these extensions to the parameterization. And what we find is that each of the PDFs when we expand the parameterization results in delta chi squares of improvements of something in the region of 10 to 20. So cumulatively, it's an improvement of 73 over our global fit, which is an enormous improvement and shows that this level of precision and this level of flexibility is necessary for the best fit. And it reduces some, but not all of the tensions that you can see between the data sets. 
So now the data, rather than the theoretical improvements, well, we include the final HERA data, which came out, uh, the inclusive data, which came out just off after our last PDFs. We didn't update the PDFs because even though the PDFs improved, particularly it's slightly in the uncertainties, then it wasn't high enough to warrant a new release. As with everyone else, we saw that the chi squared wasn't optimum at low Q squared. We now also include the combined charm data, and as uh, we heard earlier, the fit to this is not all that good. Uh, that's seen by everybody, but we include it. it. It doesn't particularly display tensions with other data sets. It's simply very difficult to fit. Uh, as well as HERA data, we include the final D0 data, asymmetry data. We did initially fit it as electron asymmetry, but we're persuaded by the uh, CDF and D0 people to actually include it as W asymmetry data, because even though you need a PDF correction to map back from the electron to the W asymmetry data, that's only a small model dependent uh, correction. Whereas the smearing that you get by using the lepton data means that you lose a large degree of sensitivity to the high X part on distributions, which are probed far more directly by the W data. So if we include the W data as opposed to the electron data, we get a considerable change in particularly the, up, the down quark at very high X and a considerable improvement in the uncertainty, although it's a bigger effect if we do that before fitting the LHC data. So the LHC data, we fit lots and lots of different data. So there's W and Z data from Atlas, CMS, and LHCB, W plus charm jet data, uh, high mass gel in, uh, w plus jet data, ZPT data, lots of new top data, both single, uh, single differential, double differential, and inclusive, and jet data from CMS and Atlas. So in general, that means that we've got 20 new data sets from the LHC, and in, in general, most of them are fit very well. Some of them are not fit all that well, like the Atlas W and Z data that we've already heard about, and the uh, Atlas W data at 8 TV, because we include the 8 TV as well as the 7 TV Atlas W and Z data. Uh, even though the fit is not that great, again, much of that can be seen as being due to fluctuations, so there are clearly some tensions with other data sets that I'll mention briefly. But all the data sets that we fit relatively poorly, we see similar fits as far as we're aware from other groups. So this is an example of how precise this data is. This is the Atlas ATV W plus W minus and Z data or Lelian data since it's over a variety of mass spins. Uh, you can see that we have to move the data relative to the theory via the correlated systematic uncertainties to get our best fit. But most of that is actually the luminosity uncertainty. It's just a normalization difference of that data set. So the effect of the LHC data is fairly significant on some of the PDS. It changes our high X gluon a little bit, though generally only just about outside the level of uncertainties. Our D valence changes quite a lot. The details of the D bar over U bar are affected. And as we've heard before, the uh, strange quark is brought up in the region of 10 to the minus 1 to 10 to the minus 3 by the Atlas W and Z data. That's one of the more significant changes. However, we see poor, one of the reasons we see poor fits, which we actually deal with rather than just say that they are poor fits, is because of some of the correlated uncertainties, particularly the ones generated by modeling using Monte Carlos. Because we find that in the case of jet data, if you go to different rapidity bins, or in the case of differential top data, if you fit different distributions, the, the actual shift of data compared to theory uh, wanted in order to get the best fit by using these correlated systematics can actually be very different in these different bins. And this can be seen by comparing basically the difference between the shifts of data relative to theory for a certain correlated systematic when you fit in either different rapidity bins for jets or different distributions for top. And you see that some of them stick out and really want to be very different from each other. And those generally are very much uh, the ones which are related to modeling uncertainties. So we use these data sets, the sort of smooth decorrelation, which was actually advocated in the Atlas ATV jet data. 
So when we do this, we do get acceptable fits to all the data sets, and we now then determine our uncertainties in the eigenvector method as usual, and we have 32 eigenvectors, which is an extra one for each PDF, and even two for the S plus S bar distribution. Our mean tolerance is three to four, and we find that the uh, main constraint on our, on our eigenvectors comes from all sorts of different data sets. About half of it is now from HERA data sets, but there's also constraints from lots of other data sets, fixed target, Teletron, et cetera, Daimuon data. We find that HERA doesn't really provide constraints on our eigenvectors, but it is still the dominant constraint on our central fit. And in order to investigate that in more detail, we tried to see what happened if we left the HERA data out of the fit and fit everything else. And you can see here the yellow compared to the green is what happens when we leave the hero out. And you do indeed see a very significant change in the size of the error bars, particularly at very small x, and also systematic shifts again, particularly at small x, but also in the normalization of the high x quarks and quite a significant change in the S plus S bar. So as we've heard before, the HERA does provide some indirect constraint on this and is in tension with some of the other data sets. However, we see that our error bands are pretty much always overlapping. So even though the uncertainty goes up and the central values move when we take the HERA data out, then we still have consistency between taking it out and leaving it in. Robert, you have two minutes left. Okay, I'm coming towards the end. So how do our new PDFs compare to our previous ones, the MMHT 2014? Well, here we have the gluon distribution, so you can see that the change is not that significant. It's well within errors everywhere. There's a change in shape at high X. Uh, there's a reduction in uncertainty pretty much everywhere. Um, the gluon, in particular, really is pulled out in a different way by different data sets. So um, this is a complicated issue, so I'll only mention it very briefly here. We fit top data, ZPT data, and check data. They all pull in different directions. You can see all of these curves here are what happens if you leave one or two of these types of data out. And you get different results. You even get different results within the different types of data. So our strange quark goes up, as we've already seen. It's pulled up by either the 7 or the 8 TVWZ data from Atlas, or both. And in fact, it's very, very consistent effect between the two. So we fit both of these types of data because they are certainly self-consistent with each other. The U valence changes a bit, the D valence changes a lot, and a lot of this change is due to data, but also a lot of it is due to our increased uh, in, increase in flexibility in the parameterization. The S plus S bar doesn't change very much, but it's more uh, consistent or it's more uh, obviously non-zero now. The light C goes up. This is the combination of all the light quarks. This is largely because a higher fraction of this is now strange quark. Uh, the down quark goes, D plus um, U bar goes down a bit, but this is more than countered by the increase in the strange quark. And D bar minus U bar is now much more uncertain at very small x. But if we plot D bar over U bar, we find that even though we don't constrain it, it tends to one to a very good level of precision at very small x. We find that the NLO fit is now much, much worse for some of the data, particularly the Atlas data, particularly the LHC data. And in fact, it's now an unacceptable quality fit within the global fit. So now the precise data we have is ruling out NLO. Just okay. very quickly. It's, it's coming to a close. Our best fit value of our 1174, so still consistent with the world average. Uh, it's higher at NLO. And we have just flashed predictions for a variety of uh, benchmark cross sections. Most of them don't change much. The errors go down, but ratios of WOZ change. And our predictions for a variety of data sets we don't include in the fit, like W plus R 13 TV, single top data are all very good. So to conclude, uh, the LHC data is having a very significant impact. Theory is now catching up with the precision data with all the NNLO predictions. We've improved our parameterization enormously, which has led these combined 
access together with the new data have led to significant changes in some of our PDFs, but not generally in the central ones like the Guon and the Apple. We see precision data causing some problems due to correlated errors and their intentions. I just to point out that with very centrally PDFs with very half esque Okay, thank you very Hello? much, Robert. Are there any questions? I don't see anybody. Last moment to think about questions for Robert. If not, then we will move then to the last talk of this session. And this will be report from the Zeus collaboration. Excuse me, did I hear somebody? I'm sorry. No, uh, okay. So Carolina, may I ask just, just the question to, to Robert's nice presentation? Absolutely, yes. Where, uh, Robert, you. where would you see the main next developments in the theoretical uh, part? Yeah, because we had the NNN PDF, which even were claiming a 1% accuracy. Uh, you, in my, in my impression, you are a little bit more cautious. Yeah, I'm a little bit. How would you summarize there the situation from the theoretical or the scheme dependencies? You name it. I don't have to explain it to you. How would you see this? I think that to, to get to 1%, we really, I, I actually find it difficult to believe it's going to be 1% without uh, an extra order in the PDFs. I think that the, um, if you start taking into account, as I said, I haven't included the theory uncertainties here, that we are doing work on that. And once you start taking account of that, uncertainties are only going to go up rather than down. And as we've heard in other talks, in our Beyond the Standard Model talk, at some point, the data is going to be bet better than the theoretical precision. And I'm not sure that we are at 1%. We're probably close to that, but I'm not sure we're better than 1% or perhaps even at 1% of the ordering QCD that we're at at the moment. So thank you. So we, we have to work harder and uh, stay patient. And there, there, are, there are still some cross-sections mm -hmm. where we still don't have them at N, NLO, for example, W plus JARM, at least in a way that we can compare directly with data. Okay, I see that Paul raised his hand. Go ahead. So, so Robert, on, on slide 20, you pointed to the tensions in, at high X coming from LH, between different LHC data sets. And um, we also saw yesterday that maybe there's tensions between different global fitters. I mean, do, do, can you give us any sort of insight or sort of prospects on how that might be resolved? What would, what would make um, it? Well, I can actually highlight um, what Joey mentioned yesterday, that we are doing a very thorough benchmarking uh, exercise. And I think we are actually understanding where some of the differences come from. And I think we have some preliminary understanding where it, certainly this particular thing that I'm showing on the high X view on, I think we understand better where some of the differences are coming from now. However, it's also the case that uh, the different data sets are pulling in different directions to a certain extent. And at some level, how much of a weight the different data has in a particular fit is, is simply one of the things that leads to one of the differences in the high X gluon. So whether that's because of the data or because of the limitations in the precision of the theory, it's not completely clear, but we are, we are making some sort of progress in understanding this. So the benchmarking exercise will start to unravel that, you think? With, well, from data or it, theory. It, will, it will help. So just, just to advertise that we're going to get a talk by this from Tom, who's part of our group tomorrow uh, in this session. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Robert. OK, any more questions? I don't see any raised hands. If anybody wants to ask something. No, okay. 
Then thank you, Robert, again. And we will move to the last um, talk of this session. Uh, this will be Ritu showing us the uh, PDFs at high X using uh, Zoom's data. Ritu, could you share your slides with us, please? And I will remind you two minutes before the end of your talk. Please start. So I hope you see my slides. We can see your slides and we can hear you, yes. Okay, so through this talk, I want to report the recent uh, result or the analysis from Zeus collaboration, which was published last year. So it's about the study of parton, uh, proton parton distribution functions at high X. Uh, a brief reminder, uh, about HERA, which I need not to, but for the sake of completeness. So it, HERA was a facility which operated for about 20, uh, for about two decades, and uh, it collided electron and proton beams up to energy of 318 center of mass. So this analysis is based on the HERA2 run, which collected about 300 picoban inverse of data. And I will give you here, a, a brief insight to the motivation of the Zeus analysis that was taken. Uh, so here at the bottom, I have a reference of the Zeus paper, which is which was published in 2014. And on the right side here, I show one plot from this paper. So these are the double differential cross sections measured by the Zeus collaboration uh, neutral current. And so these are uh, the cross sections which are still not used in the PDF determination. So this data is special, I would say, because of the bins, because of the cross sections that are reported up to a value of X1. I would uh, ask you to please see the linear scale on the X axis. This is X and Q square bins here. So there are two type of uh, cross sections being reported here. One are in blue, which are uh, a picture from the Zeus data uh, has is shown at the top. So these are the events where the uh, electron and the jet information is there in the detector. And because of that, the Q square X determination is possible. So here we have reported double differential cross sections, but after a certain edge, the jet is not uh, taken or uh, not seen in the detector. So these events, so these events are the events for which Q square determination is possible. But for the X, we know that the X is uh, the value of X for these events is greater than certain X edge. So uh, an integrated cross sections is reported or was reported, which are shown here in black uh, points. So here I have uh, shown a comparison of the high Q square data from Zeus and high X data, uh, which is reported in this uh, publication. So high Q square data is the data which is co then combined with the H1 data on high Q square and is already there in the PDF uh, determination. But here we see, if we compare the blue and the, the red points, we see that the high X data reaches to a, a higher value in X and also is finally bent in the region where the, uh, the shape of the PDFs fall sharply. So that was the motivation to, uh, to do an analysis again and uh, to facilitate the use of this data into the PDF determination. So one of the reasons this data is not included in the PDF determination is that because of the high X kinematic uh, reach or the limit, the number of events reported and observed and expected, I would say, in the, the high X bins are very small because of which the Poisson statistics has to be used. So a transfer matrix has been developed for the, uh, for the detector for this data. 
And so this equation on the left side would give us the prediction of the events in the cross-section bins from any PDF. If we integrate it in X and Q square and take into account the uh, detector and analysis effects. So this equation can be approximated through this, where lambda would be the uh, bond level cross uh, bond level number of events, and nu j would be the number of events at the reconstructed le level or in the PDF uh, or in the cross section bins. So a i a j i is the matrix which can be divided into two parts. T matrix T and R. So here T would be the transfer matrix and R would be, would be the radiative effects. So T would take into account all the detector and analysis effects and it would give a probability that an event generated in the jth, uh, event generated in a uh, ith bin, it gets reconstructed in the jth bin. So here, a visual representation of uh, what is going on. So uh, on the left side are the cross-section bins in which the events or the cross-sections were reported. And now on the left, on the right side, is the distribution in the generated uh, X and Q square phase space. So it is the distribution of all those events where they are coming from. So if we convolute this uh, distribution with the transfer matrix, which is calculated in the uh, Zeus Monte Carlo like this, we get to the number of expected events in the cross-section bins. So, uh, using the transfer matrix and the matrix and the vector R, the comparison of the different PDFs has been done. The comparison has been done at the generator level for, from different PDFs. So lambda is the uh, number of events at the bond level. So when it is multiplied or the radiative corrections are taken into account, we get the number of events at the generator level. Now these generator level events are compared from different PDFs to the HERA PDF uh, 2.0. And if we convolute this generator level events with the transfer matrix T, which has been uh, extracted from the Zeus Monte Carlo, we get the expectation for the number of events observed in the cross-section bins. So first I will show uh, the uh, ratio of the generator level cross sections in different PDFs to HERA PDF 2.0 in bins of Q square and X. So here mu would mean that we are looking at the generator level after the radiative corrections are taken into account. And we see at high X, there, are, there is a lot of difference uh, between uh, the different PDFs and HERA PDF 2.0. Also shown are the PDF uncertainties from HERA PDF and NN PDF shown in the bands here. The similar plot has been made for E minus P data. And we see the same conclusions as from the previous slide here. So the, uh, the, there are differences between different uh, PDFs. So next, I will talk about the comparison at the reconstructed level. So number of events at the generator level when convoluted with the transfer matrix give us the expectations at the uh, cross-section bins, which then be compared directly to the number of events observed in the data. And a probability can be calculated using a Poisson statistics for all the bins all the cross-section bins. And from this probability, we can calculate a chi-square, a base factor. So uh, to calculate the base factor, we have uh, for different PDFs, we have taken HERA PDF 2.0 as the base. 
And in the next slide, I will show also the ratio of this probability being calculated for, for different PDFs uh, with respect to the HERA PDF. So here, uh, different PDFs have been compared at the cross-section bins and the probabilities have been calculated with respect to the ratio of the probabilities have been calculated with respect to the HERA PDF 2.0. The chi-square has been shown up and a p-value has been calculated. So for E minus P and E plus P data, if we look at the p-values for E plus P data, we see that HERA PDF 2.0 has a smaller value of p-value as compared to all other PDFs. And uh, this trend is reversed. If we go to E minus P, where the p-value of HERA PDF 2.0 is higher. So now we divided this uh, date, this uh, the, the, uh, the bins that we have to the higher x and lower x bins, where higher x would mean taking each, uh, in each q square, the last two x bins. And we divided this table into the two uh, ranges and we see that our conclusions remain pretty much the same for the two data sets. So now in this slide I will talk about the statistical and systematic uncertainties that were checked uh, for this analysis. So there are two type of uh, uncertainties that may affect. So one is uh, one are those that affect the predictions already at the generator level and the other that affect the transfer matrix it itself. So type one would uh, include the luminosity measurement, which would scale the generator level events up and down. And then the knowledge of the radiative effects and the PDF uncertainties. And at the transfer matrix level, the different uh, type of uncertainties are the Monte Carlo statistical fluctuations, all the uncertainties that were quoted in the Hayek's paper itself, and choice of the PDF uncertainty to build the transfer matrix. So all these uncertainties have been taken into account. They have been studied in detail. The description is also given in the paper. And it has been found that the luminosity and uncertainty measurement is the main uh, systematic uncertainty here. So I would conclude with this, that the technique of building transfer metrics has been uh, developed for the high X use data and has been presented here. So this te transfer metrics technique can be used to predict the number of events in the given cross section bins in the Monte Carlo. And these, have been used uh, as shown here to compare the number of events predicted by different PDFs. So the base factor and p-values from different PDFs have been calculated and uh, they have been sh shown here. So uh, from this study, we found that differences are there in different PDFs. The differences are there in E minus P and E plus P data sets and the higher and the lower X ranges. So, and we studied uh, different systematic uncertainties and dominant systematic uncertainty was found to be the uncertainty in luminosity measurement. The direction on how to include, uh, the first direction on how to include this high X data in the PDF fits is provided uh, in the paper. So which bins to take uh, and which bins to remove like that. So with this, uh, I would like to thank you for your concentration. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ritu. Are there any questions? Uh, I see Arif, please. I would like to ask you, so how big are radiative correction in your analysis? 
So uh, can you repeat your question? I would like to know how big are radiative corrections in your analysis? So the radiative uh, corrections, uh, I mean, they were found uh, to be of the order of uh, 10% are, as I remember it correctly. So it varies. But, uh, no, I mean, but it, it, it should depend from the area of X. Yes, yes. If you, so if you go to very uh, low X, it should be grown. And yes, by yes, high, it it's different. Yes. But, yes, that's, uh, that's and you have used this uh, program Heracles, no? Uh, yes. Uh, well, so Heracles was used uh, to, so there were two independent studies done uh, mm -hmm. to study the radiative correction. So Heracles was used and so events were generated like, as I remember it correctly, with corrections and without corrections using different PDFs. And then the ratio was seen and using different PDFs. So yeah, your, your uh, observation is right. It was growing in the lower X range and then mm -hmm. was getting flatter. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, are there any more questions to Ritu? Uh, I don't see or hear anything. So I guess this was the last talk of our first session and I wanted to thank everybody, especially the speakers for excellent talks and also staying in time. I did not have to use any crude methods to keep you in line. So everything went perfectly. And I guess we are only four minutes, uh, you know, uh, outside our time, but that's not much. I, we are meeting in about half an hour for the second session that will be chaired by Pia. So I see you soon there. Thank you.